Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so I think we are going to start with the second part. So this, as I said, I will uh, finish the slides from the first presentation to uh, show a few examples from calculations and how this compares with, um, with experiments. So since you've seen this example in uh, almost all the tutorials that we've done in EPW, and in fact the four tut first tutorial on first exercise in the tutorial um, on superconductivity, it's also going to be on lead. Uh, I will just give a quick uh, uh, overview of, uh, uh, of superconductivity in lead. So this uh, it, uh, it's a, uh, so, uh, can be, uh, lead can be treated with the isotropic Migdali-Eliasberg formalism. Of course, you can treat it with the anisotropic as well, but uh, I'm just going to, uh, uh, in this study, I just did the isotropic Migdali-Eliasberg formalism. And this is uh, formally, if you were to solve the two, uh, if we go back here, if you were to solve this two, okay, sorry, these two equations in the superconducting state at different uh, temperatures, once you have lambda, so you will solve this at given t, you, can, uh, you will obtain two solutions, one, uh, 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 a solution for z uh, and a solution for delta. And in this plot, I'm just showing, sorry, here, I'm just showing the solution for d as a function of the imaginary Matsubara frequencies. This, in fact, are discrete points, but I, I am just showing them as a, as a line. But effectively, uh, there are, uh, if, you are, if I were to show the data, that this should be discrete points along this curve. And um, uh, all you, the, whole inf the only information that you get in the, on the imaginary frequency or useful information at this point is basically this super, uh, 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 superconducting gap edge. And this is basically your gap uh, 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 that if you were to take to make this plot a different temperature, so this is a plot at a specific temperature. If you were to re, uh, re, uh, redo uh, and solve the equation at different temperature, you are going to get different difference of these curves. And from all those curves, you basically take this value of the uh, leading superconducting gauge at i omega equal zero. And uh, later in the next talk, I will explain why th this, this works. So if you plot these uh, points at different temperatures that you uh, solve the uh, migdal eliasberg equations, you will get this curve, which is basically your superconducting gap. Yeah? So this is uh, in the limit, of course, you, uh, in practice, we cannot do t equal to zero. Yeah? So we'll, we go as close to zero as possible, but you can see that you always get this kind of flat behavior, so we can extrapolate to, uh, to the zero temperature. And then the point where the critical temperature becomes zero, the gap goes to uh, 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 vanishes. Yeah? So Tc, the critical temperature, as I said, is defined as the temperature at which this delta naught is going to be equal to, uh, to zero. Um, so I, um, uh, you can also see a comparison between the Bing and Elias Ben formulas and SCF DFT. So in this case, I took the data from, uh, so this is uh, what will happen in, let's say, in, uh, in EPW if you were to use a different uh, parameter for the Coulomb interaction. You can see that this blue gap, uh, blue curve is the gap with uh, mu star 0 0.1. If you change the mu star to 0 0.09, you get a different curve and so on. And, uh, uh, and these are the experimental values. So of course, what a lot of people do in practice, but that's not necessarily a, a good idea, they change this mu star till they get a, a value that matches the, the critical temperature. Yeah? If, if, uh, if you were to calculate ab initio, then you will have a value for mu star that you can, uh, it's from uh, first principle, and that most of the time, uh, and, and I would say from my experience, it will never match your uh, TC, experimental TC. So if somebody tells you that they've done uh, first principle calculation and they predicted an exact value of TC that match exactly the experiment, that's just fortuitous. So it, you, you will never, 
uh, get the, the, the exact value at, at this point. So uh, in this plot, as I said, it shows uh, data for SEFDFT. Uh, so if you are interested, this is from this study by, by Flores. But you can see that uh, there is very good agreement. So this, indeed, new star, it's of this order in, in, in LED. Yeah? So always people say it's usually you take a value between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. So in this case, indeed, uh, a value of around 0 0.1 uh, works very well for, uh, for LED. And uh, in case, I think, uh, in this study, on SCFDFT, they even did uh, an isotropic calculation. So they fully, in fact, it's not completely full, but I would say, uh, yes, the two black curves, it's a uh, fully K resolved. So if, uh, in other words, it shows that there is some anisotropy in the superconducting gap. So in principle, if you would have solved this uh, instead of the, I would have solved instead of the isotropic uh, equation, the anisotropic ones, I would have seen some uh, smearing of this thing. So it would have not been just a simple curve, uh, one dot, but just some uh, gap. And you will see in the next example what, what that uh, w would look like. Um, so another uh, example that I want to, to show briefly is because this is the uh, large, uh, the phonon mediated superconductor with the largest critical temperature, uh, I will briefly discuss uh, magnesium diboride. And this is a, s a classical example of a two-gap uh, uh, two gap superconductivity. Yeah? So magnesium diboride has this layer structure. And there are two sets of bands at the, at the Fermi level uh, that come from the, uh, so from the sigma, so uh, in-plane uh, modes, uh, sorry, in-plane bonds. And then you have uh, PZ from the pi uh, orbitals. Yeah? So this two set of bands uh, uh, appear at the Fermi level. And as a result, the Fermi surface have multiple uh, pockets. Yeah? So the cylindrical Fermi surfaces, I think, uh, come from, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, sigma bands. And these three-dimensional uh, uh, surfaces come from the pi bands. So if you if you look at the anisotropic uh, lambda average of over uh, the Q, you can see that the structure of lambda has this uh, two uh, basically two peaks, one corresponding to a set of Fermi surfaces and a set uh, the second uh, to the second fer uh, set of Fermi surfaces. So this already suggests that there is probably some uh, anisotropy in, in the gap. So indeed, if you solve the uh, anisotropic gap equation, you, this is the superconducting gap on the Fermi surface. This is from uh, a man, uh, Samuel study. Uh, then uh, you will automatically get uh, these two gaps, one on the sigma and one on the pi. Yeah, so, and that's what I said for uh, this is this meeting. Yeah, you see some, you get some broadening. It's not just, uh, just a point. If, for example, you, you were to solve this using the isotropic gap equation, you will just have gotten one band somewhere here in between. Yeah, it's almost like an averaging of these two gaps. So that's why I'm saying that, for example, Macmillan, uh, express, uh, will, will have nev uh, can never give a reasonable description of a multi-gap uh, superconductor, especially if there are uh, the uh, gaps are very far uh, apart. Yeah, so you can see here that I, uh, we are also overestimating the TC. Uh, it's basically here. It's 50 Kelvin in uh, experiments is. Uh, uh, 40. So if you were to increase, in principle, this Coulomb interaction, you can lower the, the critical temperature. Yeah. But again, this is just an empirical parameter in, in our case. And uh, that's also a comparison with superconducting DFT. So you remember that I said that in superconducting DFT, both the electron phonon and the electron-electron interaction are on a, uh, treated on an equal footing. So um, in their first study, when they, uh, they looked at the, uh, the superconductivity in MGV2, it seemed that they got a very good agreement with the experiment. 
But then later on, the same group published, uh, uh, an, uh, or I think it's in the same paper, they uh, went into do, uh, more details and looked uh, at the behavior of the superconducting gap and the prediction of TC by varying different parameters. So if we just take a quick look at this table, basically what they did, they uh, here it's, they uh, calculated the Coulomb electron electron interaction in different approximations. And uh, uh, then for the electron phonon interaction, basically the Eliasberg spectral function, again, they just assume, so they remove the anisotropy in K. So basically they uh, average over the K, but they still kept uh, a, a two band model yeah, in, this, uh, in order to, since they knew that they need to have two uh, superconducting gaps. So this just shows how the TC uh, varies by uh, 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 varying the Coulomb interaction. Yeah? So they went from a value of 30 to a value of 50. So this will be an average RPA, which is uh, kind of close to, uh, uh, to the value that we predict using a, uh, just an average Coulomb interaction. And this is also the behavior of the delta function. Now, what's interesting when they did a fully anisotropic calculation when basically they included anisotropy in electron phonon coupling. The prediction is way below the critical temperature; it's 22 Kelvin. So it's not really clear. Uh, there might be uh, uh, there are effects that are missing, uh, unharmonic effects, adiabatic effects, but um, uh, that's the the best that uh, that we can do at, at this uh, at this point. Yeah, so that was just kind of uh, to, to understand what are the limitations of what we predict. And that's why when I said that uh, we cannot claim and we shouldn't claim that we are going to predict exactly the, the critical temperature. Yeah. Uh, and as a final two examples, this is uh, superconductivity in, uh, in gra uh, intercalated uh, bilayer graphene. So, uh, graphene is not a superconductor, but people have been looking for many years to make uh, uh, graphene a superconducting material. And uh, just a few years back, it's been showing that this, are, uh, this is a resistivity uh, plot, uh, sorry, uh, in uh, intercalated bilayer graphene, and it shows an onset of superconductivity around 4 Kelvin. And about the same time, there was also, uh, another study where uh, they did magnetoresistance measurements in cal uh, calcium doped graphite laminates. So this is not really graphite, but it's also not bilayer graphene, but the interlayer distance between the, uh, the carbon layer is uh, close to the bilayer system. And in this case, they also seen an onset of superconductivity at around 6.4 Kelvin. So we, uh, in fact, well, uh, when these papers have, uh, 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 were published, we are in fact almost ready. We are looking at the same system using uh, our model. And um, in this case, in fact, we calculated the ab initio Coulomb interactor, ab in uh, sorry, the uh, Coulomb interactor ab initio using uh, GW approach. And what we predict was that uh, we may have uh, there were multiple uh, gaps, and we predict uh, that uh, you can see here that there are different Fermi pockets. So on the, there are two electron pockets centered around gamma, and this will have these two separated gaps. And then there is another Fermi pocket that is on the, uh, ele uh, sorry, uh, whole pockets around the K point. So. This is unlike, for example, um, calcium C6, where the, um, only one superconducting gap is found. And indeed, when we applied our, uh, I'm not showing here the results, but when we applied our method on calcium C6, we are seeing one gap. So uh, our pace experiments may be able to, to confirm if indeed there are two Fermi surfaces on the uh, electron, uh, uh, electron pockets. And as a, uh, so here I said that we have calculated mu, uh, mu star. So we have used, we have done it using uh, this random fame uh, uh, approximation. 
So uh, this is a plot that shows the screen Coulomb interaction average over the Fermi surface. And this has the same structure basically at lambda. We, uh, it's just not separated, but if you were to put these three uh, plot, Fermi surfaces together on a single plot, you will see basically the same, uh, the same structure for lambda and mu. And um, uh, so in this case, we found that's a, a, a mu value of 0 0.25. And then we using uh, Anderson uh, Morel model for an electron, uh, for a, a plasma energy of 2.5 EV. And then we use the largest phonon frequency in our uh, system. We estimated the new star and they found a value of 0 0.155. Yeah? So th this just shows the behavior. Then we, we took different uh, values for uh, the phonon frequency. And we saw, uh, just to understand how new value of new star changes, I think on the right, this uh, black curve, this is how TC, the prediction of TC, will change as a function of this uh, uh, phonon frequency in the expression for the uh, mu star. And this will be the uh, mu star as a value of, again, uh, omega pH, just to get a feeling of uh, how sensitive our results were on the, uh, with the uh, uh, mu star parameter. Yeah. And finally, the last example that I'm going to show, this is uh, also graphene, but this, this time is uh, lithium decorated monolayer graphene. So in this case, there were uh, low temperature ARPET experiments that showed uh, that a gap opens uh, at around 5.9 Kelvin and the value of the superconducting gap is about 0. Point, so about 1 milli electron volts. And the measurements were done uh, for this point on the Fermi surface. When experiments were repeated for another point on the Fermi surface, there was no superconducting gap. So this suggested that, um, that there is some anisotropy in, in, in the system. Yeah? So again, we, uh, we uh, uh, did our calculation with the migdal eliasberg anisotropic migdal eliasberg formulas in EPW. And that's the superconducting gap on the, on the Fermi surface. And then we look at the, uh, at the solution we indeed find that there is one gap, but there is uh, an isotopy. Yeah? So this, uh, uh, it's uh, in agreement with the uh, experimental findings. So I think with this, I'm, this should have been the end of my first talk. And just kind of to like take home messages that we should have that we can obtain measurable superconducting properties with an isotropic resolution using migdal Eliasberg theory. However, uh, you should be careful when you claim what you are doing, yeah, that uh, you still cannot say that you are, in most cases, your TC would be not uh, spot on with the experiment. And you kind of need to understand that uh, the limitations of the method. Um, now, when it comes to uh, converging or practical issues, you will need to do, uh, calculate these electron phonometric elements on very dense meshes, yeah? And we'll see uh, more in the, in the next talk that I will give. And second, uh, the migdal eliasberg theory and this superconducting DFT describe the same physics, yeah? So, and uh, uh, in principle, if one introduces uh, a first principle approach to calculate new star, they, uh, they should uh, be in very good agreement. Questions about these parts before I move to the second talk. Okay, then I can. You said control L. View of view full screen mode. Okay, so now it's um, uh, with more detail what exactly or how exactly these uh, equations are implemented inside EPW. 
and uh, I will go over the structure of the code and then prov uh, also mention a few more technicalities when it, uh, when it comes to uh, what parameters we really need to, to converge. So as I, uh, I will describe the implementation of the anisotropic case. This is more difficult, but uh, the same uh, principle is behind uh, the isotropic case. So, um, so the key quantities that we will need to calculate is this lambda. And this we already shown is done once we know the electron phonon matrix elements. So in order to get the electron phonon matrix elements on the Fermi surface, uh, the flag that you need to set up in the input variable, this is EPH write true. And the reason why we write this on file is because we want to solve these equations at different temperature. Yeah? And the electron phonon matrix elements are temperature independent. So usually you will calculate them once and then you can reuse them when you rerun uh, your, um, the code for different temperatures. Since uh, this is quite expensive and it takes a lot of time, it's better to do it once and then you can, uh, you can uh, repeat your calculations. Then you can. Um, so when you will do this, you will create a lot of files and these files are called EPHMAT and X and this X st stands for the number of files and this is CPU dependent. Yeah? So depending on how many uh, CPUs you are gonna run your uh, original calculation, this is how many files you are gonna have with this electron phonon matrix elements. And the files originally, they are not the same size. However, when you reread them, the code redistributes them equal uh, 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 on the number of CPU that you are gonna uh, use when you solve the, the equations. And um, uh, more specifically in the code, this writing is done in the, so the central uh, file that uh, Samuel has already gone through is this EPH, uh, uh, F90, and inside we have this uh, main subroutine EPH L phonon shuffle wrap, and uh, more specifically, the writing is done in this EPH van shuffle. Yeah, um, and I put here some comments. Uh, some uh, not all the comments are, uh, for example, if you open the code. So, and not all the lines. Uh, I may have excluded some of the. Uh, lines. Uh, so if you were going to open the code, there may not be one-to-one -one correspondence between the slides and the, uh, and the code because I, I may have some, I have some extra comments here. But um, basically this is uh, uh, what the code is doing at that point. It's, uh, it, uh, it finds the irreducible K points on the fine grid uh, within a Fermi window that you specify. And is going to write a series of, uh, of files. Yeah? So besides this EPH mat, you are going to write three more files, and I'm going to describe them in more detail later. And these are the file with the frequencies on the fine Q mesh. This is a file with the eigenvalues on the, again, the file of, uh, fine K mesh. And this is a mapping between the K and Q, uh, Q plus Q points. Yeah. So once, uh, uh, so more specifically, these are the input variables that we are going to have in the code. So as I said, EPH write just is going to instruct the code to write these files, and this is you are providing information on which meshes you are really going to write the files. So this is the fine mesh for uh, electrons. This is fine mesh for phonons, and. Uh, um, particularly for the superconducting uh, uh, implementation of the super, uh, migdal elias equation, uh, you can specify uh, uh, this flag MP mesh K true. So in other words, instead of using the full K mesh, you are gonna work with the irreducible K points. And that's tremendously uh, decreases the computational resources. Now, uh, um, in order to be able to do this, and in fact, because of the structure of the superconducting uh, equations, since we need to solve them, solve them self-consistently till we get convergence, you can see here, uh, if, we go, if I go back, that we have K and K plus Q. Yeah? And this 
in order to have this mapping, you will need to specify uh, the K and Q meshes need to be commensurate. And that's what allows us to, to use the MP, uh, MP mesh K. Yeah? You cannot solve the anisotropic uh, equation using random meshes in uh, EPW. Yeah? It's because of this uh, self-consistent uh, 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 problem that we will need to, uh, to, uh, to resolve. And this is, again, a description of the files created by EPW. I already uh, uh, mentioned them in the, in the previous uh, slide. So once you have the electron phonon matrix element, you can, uh, on the Fermi surface, you can have done it in a separate run, or you can have done it in the same run where you want to solve the Eliasberg equation. Uh, this is the flag that will tell the code Basically, in fact, it doesn't tell yet the code to solve the Eliasberg equation. It just tells the code to calculate this anisotropic lambda. Yeah? So once you have uh, this G, the electron phonon matrix element, you can calculate lambda. And now you can finally solve the, uh, the anisotropic uh, equations. And for that, you will need to specify a few more flags. Yeah? So this uh, Eliasberg flag calls this subroutine. And inside this subroutine, um, OK, ah, this is only, OK, yeah, sorry, I remember. Um, in this subroutine, if, uh, if you don't specify that you want to solve the anisotropic equations, the only thing that the code is going to do is going to evaluate your uh, a spectral function, and then it's going to estimate the TC based on Macmillan formula. So in principle, you can do this uh, uh, also through the uh, phonon self-energy. So this is equivalent. Yeah? Um, but uh, the uh, difference uh, in comparison to the phonon self-energy calculation is that right now you also calculate this anisotropic lambda. So in order just to understand if you have, let's say, an isotropy in your system, maybe you don't want maybe to uh, go directly and solve the anisotropic Eliasberg equation, since that's very expensive. Maybe you just want to look at uh, lambda on the Fermi surface, and that already is going to give you some hint if you should expect an isotropy or not. So that's the reason why uh, uh, this flag was introduced, to be able to uh, work around without really solving the, the equations. Yeah? Now, uh, just by running that flag, Eliasberg, true, you are going to generate this set of files. Yeah? So you are going to get an uh, isotropic Eliasberg spectral function. You are going to get also a second file, uh, which is called, uh, and this will have different smearings. And the default, I think, are 10 smearing values. Yeah? You can change that, but that's the default. Then you, can, you are also going to get another file, which is A2F ISO. This is basically the, uh, also the Eliasberg spectral function as a function of frequency. And the second column is just the second column from basically this smearing from this file, while the rest of the columns you are going to have three N columns, where N is the number of atoms, is just the mode resolve Eliasberg spectral function. Now you need to keep in mind this mode uh, resolve doesn't have anything to, uh, any information about the specific modes to which atomic species they represent. For that, you'll, you should do, you need a projection. Yeah? So it's just uh, uh, or, uh, in the order that the modes, uh, modes appear. So it's not necessarily particularly useful, but sometimes you, you, you may want to know just in some region. Or um, Another file that you are going to get, this is uh, this uh, uh, file, and this is basically this lambda and k on the Fermi surface. So that's the file that you should plot if you want to look and understand if there is any anisotropy. Yeah? Then uh, that's the same thing, but in a different format. Uh, if you want to, uh, to plot it, like uh, uh, I think this may work with the, is this the work with Vesta? in the format that works with VESTA? Probably not. But uh, that, that's basically the same, uh, the same information. Yes, it, uh, yes I, I think this is the file that you, you can plot directly with VESTA, since it has the k points in Cartesian coordinates, and then the 
lambda, uh, the, uh, lambda nk. And uh, the same as for the Eliash spectral function, you can get the phonon density of states and the phonon, uh, pro projected phonon density of states. Yeah? The same with the know that the mode resolved do not have, does not have information about the specific uh, atomic uh, species. Questions? Okay, then um, uh, if you have, so this is the default. Now, if you have either both it is set to two in the code, you're gonna get another set of three files. No, this cannot be plotted directly with QB. This, sorry, this is a file. But it's, it contains the, the same information. So this file, if you print, this can be used to be uh, visualized directly with Vesta. Yeah? So we can uh, read this in, in Vesta directly. Uh, and this is the full anisotropic uh, Eliasberg spectral function. Yeah? If you have both indexes, nk and mk plus q. And this, I think this I'm repeating. This is just lambda in k, okay. Uh, this is also basically the same information as, uh, uh, as this, but just in a different, in a different format. And uh, uh, in, in the tutorial, it's explained more which files uh, are, are plotted. Uh, so, okay, so coming back, right now, if you go at all these files, that's basically if you plot uh, what you will get if, uh, depending which one you are plotting. Yeah? So this is the A to F. And then if you just do an integral, you will get the lambda. This is this lambda K pairs, if you were to plot. So this is the example for MGB2. You will see again that you have two structures. And this is if you were to plot the full anisotropy, what you will get. So these are the, basically the values for, for lambda. Um, so, so far we haven't solved yet the, the equation. So if you want to solve the equations, you need to put two extra flags in the input files. And if you want to solve the equation in the anisotropic case, it's this ln iso true. And since we are solving uh, initially on the imaginary Matsubara frequency, uh, imaginary axis uh, on the Matsubara frequencies, we, you need to specify this le mag true. And this in the code, if you want to look at the structure, this again is through this subroutine called Eliasberg. And it's very similar, this loop, this if is very similar to the, sec uh, to the previous part. The only difference is that right now, uh, the, the code we also call this Eliasberg and ISO imaginary axis, and that's the subroutine uh, 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 where basically the uh, anisotropic migdal eliasberg equations are solved. Yeah? So this is in this, this file, and the steps are all following. So first, you see that there is a loop over temperature. So this will be the temperature that you are going to see is set up in your input file, and I think on the next slides I will show that. Uh, first, you generate this a call generates a grid of the on the frequency point that you are going to calculate uh, 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 your uh, um, Eliasberg equation for a specific temperature. So you can see that this is temperature dependent, and then uh, that's the co the subroutine where uh, the uh, that will solve the migdal Eliasberg equations. Yeah, and. This is just some internal thing where you just uh, call, uh, here you are going to call the lambda, yeah, this anisotropic lambda, sorry. So, uh, so this is done uh, self-consistently. You can see that there is a do loop uh, either until convergence is reached or the number of iteration have, have been reached. So uh, if you, uh, and then the code is going to stop and it will, uh, calculate the free energy. I will give a, a bit more details about this in the next step. Uh, in principle, uh, you can also have a restart option. So uh, let's say you have already calculated uh, a t equal 10. 
yeah, and you have stopped your calculation and now you want to restart the temperature 15. Um, in principle, you can reread your uh, gap function uh, and uh, delta and, and z on at 10 equal 10 and use that as a feed in your, uh, as a first guess for uh, when you solve the, the equations. And that flag can be uh, with this restart, restart option, emag read equal to. So first, what the code is going to do, a temperature, let's say 10, uh, 10 Kelvin, it's just going to read these files, and then it's going to proceed to the next temperature and solve the, the, uh, the equation. And uh, 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 these are, so these flags, as I said, these are, this will just tell the code basically to calculate uh, lambda. This will tell to solve the, the anisotropic equations on the imaginary axis. And these are the temperatures uh, at which you want to calculate. Yeah? So one way to specify the temperature, then you will give a mean and max temperature and the step, a number of steps. And then that will be an uh, uh, equally spaced step uh, from uh, mean to max. And this is the threshold for the convergence in the self-consistency for the solution on the imaginary axis, or as I said, you can uh, uh, you also provide a number of iterations. So depending which one is reached first, the code is going to stop. And this is the cutoff frequency for the Matsubara frequency. Yeah? So you will, as I said, you cannot have that sum. Uh, I mean, you want to have uh, as many terms as possible, but you need to truncate it at some point. And mu c is just the Coulomb uh, parameter. Um, <clears throat> that's just to show that you can provide the temperature. Uh, so this, as I said, it will give uni uniformly, uh, or uh, the temperature are going to be uniformly spread. If you don't want uniform spread temperature, and as you remember in my, my plot, I, I had something like this. So yeah, here you can have like, uh, larger distance between your temperature points, but here you want a closer sampling. Yeah, so that's another way to uh, to input the temperature, and then you can specifically give uh, your temperature uh, value. Now, again, when you are going to run this uh, anisotropic calculation, the code is going to generate many many files, and some of them are quite big. So you need to uh, pay attention, especially uh, yeah, to the disk space when you are going to uh, uh, generate these files. So XX this time indicates the temperature. So for each temperature that you are going to uh, evaluate the, the equations, you are going to have this, this type of file. So the first file, uh, uh, and this is one of the most useful files, is this emag underscore aniso underscore XX. And this file has five columns. The first is the, the frequency. Um, the second is uh, the uh, uh, energy, uh, the eigenvalues with respect to the Fermi energy. Then this is the Z. This is uh, delta. And this is the Z in the normal state. So if, uh, you will see why this is needed later on. Um, and then if you want to make those plots that I show with the delta. Oh, no, sorry. Um, this plot, uh, uh, since you want, let's say, uh, to plot something like this, as I said, that every temperature, you just take the limit when i omega n or j goes to 0. This is basically what this file uh, contains. Yeah? So it's the limit of delta and k for uh, the uh, uh, zero Matsubara frequency. Yeah. And that again, this you will have one file per temperature. And finally, this is just uh, uh, the same information like this, but only on the uh, providing also, also the Cartesian coordinates if you want to plot on the Fermi surface. This file and this file are equivalent. The only difference is that this can be plotted directly with Vesta. Yeah. And uh, this will only be generated if you specify i verbosity 2 in your uh, input file. Yeah? This will be, by default, this 
won't be by default. And here you also have an extra term, which is for the bands, yeah? Depending on how many bands, like for example, for magnesium diboride, there are a few bands that are uh, on the Fermi surface. This will be the N index, yeah, this YY. So that, that's kind of just look a bit what, what we are getting, just to get an idea. This will be if you plot this EMAG and isophile, and this is uh, when I plotted the Z column as a function of, uh, this should have been I omega, the, the imaginary frequency, and this is if, when I plotted the delta column as a function of I omega. Yeah? So, and this is the magnesium diboride case, so this is why you see this uh, anisotropy and two, two gaps. And that's what you will get for the convergence. Yeah? Uh, uh, so if you just take now this value in this limit, that are written uh, in this input, sorry, in this input file, you can extract this plot. Yeah, so this is for specific temperature. And if you were to plot the cube file, you will get uh, this plot. And uh, Samuel has a YouTube tutorial explaining how to get this, uh, this nice, uh, nice plot. So if you have questions about this, Samuel is the best person to, uh, to ask. Um, finally, what uh, do you need to converge? You can, as I said, you will need to converge a few, quite a number of parameters. So first of all are the K and Q meshes, uh, this VS cut, and then there is this additional, the Fermi window, yeah, that you can uh, specify in the, in the input file. And just to get an idea how important all these parameters are, this is just an example of the superconducting gap uh, uh, dependence. So this is just the, uh, the highest gap in MGB2 uh, by varying the K and Q meshes. Yeah, so you can see that it's not just, let's say, that you need to converge the K mesh, but you also need to converge the Q mesh. And uh, that's the same, kind of the same plot uh, for the same gap as a function of this cutoff frequency. Yeah? So you can also see 5, 10, 15, and so on. So principle, you, you should go to, uh, uh, to a cutoff as large as possible till this doesn't change. In practice, uh, it's, it's, uh, the calculations are getting too demanding. So uh, uh, I, I have mentioned this many times, but anyway, this, what I, we, I uh, say uh, that indeed uh, describing an isotropic quantities, it will require dense meshes and uh, quite a lot of computational resources. And uh, on the other hand, uh, if you just look at isotropic cases, you still need to converge, but you will see that um, you can go around with maybe not such dense meshes. Like for example, this is uh, again from the same work, while for the, the same meshes that here, that shows that delta vary a lot. In this case, it shows that lambda was pretty much converged, yeah? but this is just an isotropic quantity. But, uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, you can uh, also extract, so for, for now, we, we just, I just discussed Tc and delta, yeah? but uh, there are, the, um, once you solve and you have a solution for, for delta and the z, you can extract some other properties and compare them with experiments. So one of them, you can get the um, um, specific heat, superconducting specific heat, and for that you will need to estimate the free energy. And that's the expression for the free energy. And then the superconducting specific heat is just the second derivative with respect uh, to temperature. And this is a plot that Samuel has, uh, has calculated. And I think the uh, blue curve is the uh, superconducting uh, gap evaluated uh, using the solutions from the Eliasberg calculation. And this is comparison with a two gap uh, BCS model and this one BCS model. Yeah, so if you want to learn more detail about this plot, you can find it in, in, um, in this reference. Um, Okay. I 
think this is the I don't really know why I put this. Uh, uh, it's just a repeat of, the, ah, this is just to show where in the code, yes, where in the code this uh, free energy is calculated and in, it's, in the, it's automatically done once the convergence is, is, is reached. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question, uh, so I guess I should stop for just a second here to see if there are questions since I will move on from the an uh, imaginary axis to the real axis, and that was a co question that somebody asked in the first part of the talk. So, um, so, so far, what we just seen indeed is that the migdaler yerber equation on the imaginary axis can be solved, uh, and only uh, from the numeric uh, computational point of view, we are doing this because numerically it's very easy or efficient to do just sums over finite number of much better frequency. But in the end, they are going to only provide information about critical temperature, superconducting gap, and the free energy that will give you the specific heat. Yeah? If you want to extract additional information about the spectral function, like, for example, the quasi-particle density of states or the single uh, particle excitation, excitation spectrum, then you need to solve the equations uh, on the um, uh, real axis, yeah? And formally, uh, uh, you can di uh, do direct ev evaluation on the real in energy axis, but this will be very demanding computationally. Yeah? I don't think in, uh, this has been done in the anisotropic uh, case directly. Um, and, and the reason being because if you work out the math, you will see that you will have, to, uh, uh, you will need to evaluate many principal uh, value integrals. And uh, in fact, as I uh, said earlier, this is implemented in, uh, in uh, Eliasberg, uh, in the code, but just for the isotropic case, but it's not, uh, uh, it has not been tested in a while. So I, I uh, it, it should work, but uh, uh, anyway, it needs maybe more testing. Uh, as an alternative, and that's what it's, uh, I, uh, I usually use, is to solve the solutions as we've do done so far on the, uh, uh, on the real axis by doing an analytic continuation on the imaginary frequency axis. And this can be, analytic continuation can be done in two ways. You can use Pade approximants, and this is very cheap. And uh, that's the recommended method if you use, uh, when you solve the anisotropic equation, or can, in principle, you do it by an iterative procedure, but the, uh, procedure. But again, this becomes very heavily computationally. So, as, uh, just to give you as an example, uh, this is seconds. This could be hours to days, depending on how many uh, k points you you have. Um, so, to do this analytic continuation, uh, that's the part. It's also done in this. Subroutine, and this is the flag L Pade will tell the code to do a, a Pade analytic continuation, uh, an analytic continuation using Pade, or if you do uh, an, uh, an analytic continuation using this iterative uh, method. And the reason why this is cheap, because this is basically just one shot, you just do it at once. This analytic continuation, the same, uh, in the same way as you solve it on the imaginary axis, it involves a self-consistent solution. Yeah? And the equations, uh, I, I am not going to show them here, but uh, if you go uh, in, uh, in uh, the MGB2 paper that I am showing, uh, I showed this reference in my first talk, you are going to find uh, the equations in, in, that, uh, in that article. And uh, as you can see here, once you solve this equation in the, on the real axis, the, co the code, it, once it reaches convergence, it will also calculate the quasi-particle density of states. Yeah? So you will have an extra information. And the, only the, the additional flags that you are going to need to introduce, this is LPADE. This will tell, you, tell the code to solve the PADE uh, or to the PADE method. L uh, continuation will tell the code to solve this analytic continuation method. And only this has a threshold. This, since it's one shot, doesn't have a convergence uh, uh, parameter, so you don't need to specify anything else. And uh, again, uh, similarly, I'm not going to uh, 
describe this, but it will be a set of files for each uh, uh, for each uh, run. And again, uh, they will have the information about the uh, Z and delta, but now on the on the real axis. So, uh, how would this look in practice? Let's say, again, the isotropic case of lead. This was the solution that we saw at some specific temperature for delta as a, as a function of imaginary frequency. If uh, formally what you do, you just go from a complex number to, uh, to from the complex uh, plane to the real plane, but you still need to add a, a small uh, function. And what you are going to get while here, you had just one thing, that it was just a... a you will get the real and imaginary part. Yeah? So this is using this PADE uh, approximate method. So this is the real delta function, and this is the imaginary uh, delta function. Yeah? So, uh, and that's a comparison. So in the isotropic case uh, between the PADE approximants and this analytic continuation, the iterative method. So we can see that it's very good agreement there is a bit more structure in the analytic continuation, but overall, taking into account the huge difference in the computational cost, but the approximates method, it's, it's very, quite robust. And uh, another key thing that you should notice, while there was no structure in the uh, solution on the imaginary axis, now in the uh, real axis solution, we see that we have structure, and this happens at the scale of the phonon energy. Yeah? So in lead, the, uh, the maximum phonon, it, I think it's about 10 uh, milli electron volts. So this is why the place where you are going to see, uh, see the structure. Yeah? So this method carries additional information. And um, that's just a plot in the case of uh, MGB2, where we had two gaps. So this is delta, again, on the... Uh, Imaginary axis, this is how uh, it will look on the real axis. This is, again, is the approximants. I never used uh, analytic continuation in this case since I, yeah, it's always been just too expensive. But again, you will see structure at the uh, uh, representative phonon frequency in the MGB2. And in MGB2, the maximum, I think the largest phonon frequency goes to 200 MeV. So you will see that it's a different scale compared to, to lead. Um, now, um, in the real axis, you can also uh, look at the, I'm just going to quickly uh, discuss this, you can also look at the single particle Green's function on the real axis. And that's, uh, I, uh, in my previous talk, I had this uh, expression for G as a function of I omega. So in principle, if you just, change i omega to omega, you can rewrite this, um, this equation. And again, tau naught, tau one, tau three, these are just the uh, 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 Pauli matrices. And the poles of, this di uh, of the diagonal, so, uh, diagonal components of, uh, of G give the elemental excitations of the superconductor. So, the, you can take the 1-1 one, one component. You remember this is a 2 by 2 matrix. Yeah? I showed in the previous talk. So the diagonal elements will be the excitation, while the non-diagonal are related to the uh, Cooper pairs. So um, if you look at the poles of this function, uh, you, you can uh, find this, uh, this expression. Yeah? Uh, and then you can see that this is E and K appears here and also appears here and here. So this is delta is a function of E and K. Yeah? Um, and this can be directly related to what we, uh, we've seen before for the uh, equivalent to the normal state. This uh, real part of E and K is the quasi-particle energy renormalization by, but for the superconducting pairing. And the imaginary part is the quasi-particle inverse lifetime. So this is equivalent to what Feliciano has uh, been showing in for the normal state, but only that is for the uh, superconducting pairing. Yeah? And at the Fermi level, basically when E and K is equal to EF, 
the quasi particle shift you can see that is just real part of uh, so since this is zero this is going to be just the real part of delta n k of e n k so in other words this will identify to the your leading edge of the superconducting gap so towards that value when i will show this will happen only at very small values so in that plot of delta as a function of omega this is basically your limit at omega equals zero, yeah, or very close to omega equals zero. Yeah, and this is the binding, in fact, 2D, I, I, this is incorrect, 2D of 2 delta E is the binding energy for electrons in a Cooper pair. So that's as much energy, this is the energy that you will need to provide in order to break a Cooper pair. In principle, you are not going to break just one pair, you will need to break all the pairs in the, in the system. Um, so, but once you have this uh, uh, diagonal element, you can also, so besides that you get this information about the poles and quasi-particle energy and the normalization and the shift, you can also get the superconducting quasi-particle density of states. And this is just the imaginary part of this uh, element that you will then need to integrate it over E and K and multiply by minus 1 over pi. So in the BCS limit, you can take Zn k equal to 1. And if you perform an integral, you are going to get this expression. Yeah? So this, again, you can see, in fact, uh, this is integrate uh, average already in the code. But in principle, you can also look at the uh, anisotropic and k, and you will get a bit of uh, uh, an isotropy information, but uh, what you usually, and this is what the code calculates directly, uh, it doesn't print this out, but it's, already, it's calculated in the code, it's just not printed on file, you get an average over the Fermi surface, so you get uh, this, this thing. And that's the uh, plot for, in case of M, uh, MGB2, again, this is the superconducting uh, quasi-particle density of states, calculated a different temperature and you can see that you can uh, this is the dose yeah so okay if we look at uh, 15 kelvin you can see the two gaps and if you go and look uh, compare with the delta over t temperature you'll see that these are the values the average values of the pi gap and the uh, sigma gap yeah? and you see that as you increase the temperature you close this this, uh, this gap, yeah, you will get tower, uh, towards uh, uh, the normal, uh, the metallic state. Uh, another thing that you can use, uh, 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 it's basically you can get the spectral function. Uh, and this has been done, uh, this is not our study, but uh, has been done in this paper but, uh, by Sana. But if you were to calculate this uh, spectral function, this is in the case of the normal state, you cannot really see very well in this plot, but there is a line here yeah, that is continuous, and this is the Fermi, uh, uh, Fermi energy. Uh, uh, and this is the same plot. So this was calculated for the normal state. This is calculated for the superconducting state. And here you should see there is a gap opening. So it, the curve looks like this and like this. Yeah. So this is your superconducting gap, uh, but just the, the resolution in this picture is not so so great. Um, so I think with this I, I am almost done. So uh, just a few more things, just ideas about different parameters that you need to pay attention to, kind of more like a summary. Is this uh, the, the cutoff frequency? As I said, this will be the cutoff frequency in the Matsubara, uh, for the Matsubara frequencies, and you generally you set it somewhere between these values. Um, there is another option if you, for example, uh, since the Matsubara frequencies, if you remember, there was an expression is, um, I don't, I think it was a function of J, I don't remember, 2 pi, something, but it was a, as a function of J and temperature. Basically, as you uh, increase the temperature and if you have a fixed cutoff, you are going to have fewer and fewer uh, uh, discrete points. 
Uh, so there is an alternative option. If you want for every single temperature to have the same number of uh, Matsubara points, you can set this, uh, this parameter in the input file, nswi, and then vscat is going to be ignored. So this will mean that basically you are going to have a different cutoff, a different temperature, but you will have the same number of discrete points. Um, uh, if you use ln ISO or l ISO, you will need to always have specified this parameter. Usually the code, uh, I mean, if this is not done, the code is just going to stop and it gives you a message with a, uh, with a warning. Uh, LPADE requires LIMAG. Yeah. L uh, a, uh, uh, analytic continuation re requires both flags. And the reason why it requires LPAD is because it uses the solution from LPAD as the first guess uh, when it solves this uh, uh, self consistent equations. Um, just as a, this is more like uh, an advice, sometimes you may not know at which temperature you, you want to calculate your Eliasberg equation. So, you can first just evaluate TC uh, using Allentine formula, and this can be just as a guide for defining the temperature that you are interested in. Uh, this flag will be very important since it uh, will require to write the, uh, the uh, matrix elements on the fine meshes. And uh, if you use Eliasberg and these files are, uh, do not exist, again, the program is going to stop. Uh, with, a, with a message that you, you need these files. Um, another thing, if you change the fine and Q, K and Q meshes, obviously you will need to regenerate these files. Yeah? So you will need to rerun another calculation where you, uh, where you generate uh, the files. Um, if you want to have uh, this kind of imag, which is a read, which is a restart option, in fact, this does. Uh, I just mentioned just one thing uh, when you can you, should, you can use this IMA grid, but in principle, it can do a few things. Um, if let's say uh, so, in, so what the code will do will read the input files uh, on the imaginary axis at the initial temperature that you provide in the code, and it can be used to do the following. You can. Uh, uh, you can solve the anisotropic equation at some temperature larger than the T where you are reading. And you just are going to use this file as your starting guess. But for example, let's say that you have solved the Eliasberg equation just on the imaginary axis. And now you want to do this PADE approximants. You can just uh, give the temperature where you want to calculate. And then it will uh, solve the, the, the PADE solution. Uh, sorry, it will find the. Uh, uh, the solution on the uh, real axis. Or maybe you haven't written this uh, Fermi surfaces and you want to redo something with Ivar Bosetti 2 for a specific temperature. So uh, you will find all the references. In fact, the other talk also have references. If you uh, want more uh, information about all this, uh, this study, like uh, this paper, it's a very nice paper if you want to uh, learn more about the uh, uh, anisotropic migdal Eliasberg equation. This is also a very nice study that uh, uh, describes the formalism. And in this study, we are describing the implementation in the EPW code. If you are interested about this PADE approximants, this is the reference you want to look at. And this is a reference uh, for the analytic uh, continuation. And with this, I think we can have questions. <laughs>